A very good day to all. In this video, we are going to discuss about how a computer system is organized and what is the basic architecture of any computer system. Let's now move on to the first topic where we are going to discuss about how a computer system is going to be organized. Now, if you look at this diagram very carefully, you will be able to understand that this is the structure of a modern general purpose computer system, which can consist of one or more CPUs and a number of device controllers such as disk controller, USB controller, graphics adapter, all of them are connected through a common bus and through which they can access the shared memory. So this is the general uh, structure of any general purpose computer system. Now, what is the purpose of these controllers, these device controllers? Now, for example, if you take the disk controller, the disk controller is now is in charge of a specific type of a device. So here, the special type of device is the disk. So this controller is in charge of the disk drives, such as audio devices or video displays. And the USB controller is in charge of the uh, various input and output devices, such as mouse, keyboard, uh, and printer. The CPU and the device controllers can execute in parallel. That is, all of them are capable of executing in parallel, competing for memory cycles. To ensure orderly access to shared memory, a memory controller synchronizes access to the shared memory. So as we know, all these devices are connected through a common bus to the shared memory. So in as already stated, all these can execute in parallel. They can execute concurrently, which means they must be able to access the shared memory. So all of them will be able to access the shared memory in an orderly fashion. And this will be controlled by a memory controller, which will be synchronized in such a way that these devices can access the memory. Now, when the computer is turned on, we all know that booting will happen. So who is responsible for this booting to take place? When the computer is turned on, the bootstrap program must locate the operating system kernel and load it into memory. So the first initial thing that has to be done is whenever a device is switched on, the booting of the OS has to take place. That is, the OS has to be loaded into the main memory. The, this is taken care of by the bootstrap program. Once the kernel of the OS is loaded and it starts executing, it means it is it can start providing services to the uh, system and its users. So, what this, uh, so thus, it means that once the OS is loaded into the main memory, the system is ready for usage. So, uh, this is the basic organization of any computer system. Now, coming next thing that we're going to discuss is, well, we're going to discuss about interrupts. What are interrupts? Now, let's... Uh, give a basic definition for any interrupt. An uh, interrupt is nothing but uh, it is uh, a signal which is generated and something which will alter the normal execution of any computer program. Uh, so what does an interrupt do? Interrupts can be both software interrupts or it can be hardware interrupts. Now there's a possibility for hardware to trigger an interrupt at any time. How are interrupts triggered? The interrupts are triggered by sending signals. So interrupts are triggered by sending a signal to the CPU. So how is the signal sent to the CPU? Through the system bus. When the CPU is interrupted, it stops at what it is doing and immediately transfers control to a fixed location. So whenever interrupts are generated, CPU will stop what it is doing and it will transfer control to a fixed location. So now what we are going to see in this flow chart here is we are going to see how and uh, once an interrupt is generated, how is that interrupt handled? How, what does the CPU do? That is what uh, we are going to see in this flow chart. Now, if you look at uh, this, uh, the step one, number one, that is the de device driver initiates I.O. So there's a need for doing an IO operation. So what happens is now the control is with the CPU. Now, what does the CPU do? CPU executing checks for interrupts between instructions. That is what happens. That is every time the CPU is going to execute the processes, what the CPU will keep on doing is it will keep checking whether any interrupt is being generated. Once the interrupt is generated, 
then the interrupt will reach the CPU. So once the CPU receives the interrupt, the controller uh, will transfer the control to the interrupt handler. Every interrupt will have its own interrupt handler. Interrupt handler is nothing but it is the code that is going to tell you how the interrupts have to be handled, what should be done when an interrupt occurs. So once the CPU receives interrupt, transfer is controlled to the interrupt handler. Right. So this is what is going to uh, take place. After that, control is with the interrupt handler. So when the interrupt handler is handling the uh, interrupt, once that code is executed, the once the interrupt handler has done its job, then control has to return back to where it, it had started. So control will return from the inter interrupt. So now what happens? CPU, would have, which had stopped doing what it was doing, will now start resuming to do all the interrupted task and this goes on. So if you carefully observe, now we discussed about step one, five, six, seven. Now what about what happens between one and five? That is what happens when the device driver initiates the IO and what happens before the CPU receives the interrupt. Now this is what happens. Look at step two, the IO is initiated. Then in step three, the input is ready, output is complete or error generates interrupt signal. So some form of interrupt is generated here. So this will transfer control to the CPU. So this is how the interrupt is generated and this is how the CPU receives it. And we saw what happens further down. So whenever interrupts are generated, this is how the CPU will act according to how it is receiving the interrupt and how it stops from what it is doing and transfers the control to a fixed location, which is nothing but the starting address where the interrupt handler is located. So I said, when the CPU is interrupted, it stops what it is doing and immediately transfers execution to a fixed location. That fixed location is nothing but the starting address of where this interrupt handler is located. Now, once it is done, then once the interrupt handler is completely uh, executed, then it, it the CPU is capable of resuming its processing of interrupted tasks and this continues. So this is how interrupts are generated and this is how it is handled. Now, when you consider uh, the types of interrupts, there are two types of interrupts that you have. One is maskable interrupt. The other one is non-maskable interrupt. Now, Non-maskable interrupt is nothing but one which is reserved for events such as unrecoverable memory errors. So errors from which you cannot recover, those are called as non-maskable interrupts. And maskable interrupts are nothing but uh, it can be turned off. These maskable interrupts can be turned off by the CPU before the execution of critical instruction. And then it could be again turn on. So this is what is meant by maskable interrupt. Now let's move on to the how the storage structure is available inside the computer system. How is the storage structure organized? So if you look at uh, this diagram very carefully, you see the arrow that is the double headed arrow which talks about storage capacity and then here again you have double headed arrow which is access type. So what happens is this, what does it mean the smaller the storage capacity, the faster the access time is. The larger the, store, so the storage capacity, the slower the access time is. So these two are uh, inversely uh, inverse with each other. If the capacity is smaller, in, that is the storage capacity is small in size, then the access time is fast. So which are the units which have smaller storage capacity. So it goes like this. The smallest is the registers. Then comes the cache. Then comes the main memory. Then comes the non-volatile memory, hard disk drives, optical disk and magnetic tapes. So if you move in this order, you'll find that the storage capacity keeps increasing. As the storage capacity increases, we find that the access time decreases. So as the storage capacity increases, access time will decrease. 
If the storage capacity decreases, access time will increase. So this is where, uh, yeah, this is how our uh, mem may, uh, the memory, entire memory, whether it is going to be the secondary memory or the primary memory or, or, or the tertiary memory, whatever it is. This is how it is structured. The primary memory com uh, is comprised of the registers, catch memory, main memory. The secondary memory is comprised of, of the non-volatile memory and the hard disk drives. And the tertiary memory is the optical disk and the magnetic tapes. These are nothing but the external devices which are attached to it. So that's about the storage structure. Now we'll move on to the uh, computer system architecture. How is the computer system uh, organized? How is it organized? Now, organized, uh, organized, that is how is how is it uh, uh, categorized? So computer system, which is organized in a number of different ways, can be categorized roughly according to the number of general purpose processors used. So you, you have single processor systems as well as you have multi-processor systems. So we know the single processor system means that they will have only one processor, that is one CPU. Whereas if you talk, talk about multi-processor systems, they, it can be of two or more processors and each will be having a single core CPU. Now, if you, when you look at the first diagram uh, that is given here, this diagram clearly shows uh, the system with the multiprocessors, okay, multiprocessor system. That is what is shown here. So, here, what is uh, shown here is you have the most common way of uh, uh, depicting a multiprocessor system is uh, one which uses symmetric multiprocessing. SMP, it is called as symmetric multiprocessing SMP, where in uh, in uh, each pure CPU processor will take care of performing all the tasks, including the operating system functions and user process. So this is a structure architecture of a symmetric multiprocessor system. This is the architecture of a symmetric multiprocessor system. Now, the most common multiprocessor systems use which multiprocessing? They use symmetric multiprocessing in which each peer CPU processor performs all the tasks, including the operating system functions and user process. Now, by the side here, the diagram that you have is uh, the diagram is the architecture of a dual core design with two cores on the same chip. With two cores on the same chip. So if we are going to have two core processors on the same chip. So how do we uh, talk about this about this design? Each core has its own register set as well as its own local catch. So L1 is nothing but local catch. So every core processor will have its own register and its own local catch, which you call it as level 1 and level 2, L1 and L2. Now we move on to the next type of an architecture, which is the clustered system. This is also one type of multiprocess system and where you will be gathering together multiple CPUs. Clustering can be either asymmetric or it can be uh, symmetrical. You have both types of clustering. Now we'll see what is meant by uh, asymmetric clustering and what is meant by symmetric clustering. In asymmetric clustering, one machine is in hot standby mode while the other is in running the applications. The hot standby host machine does nothing but it will just keep monitoring the active server. If the server fails, the hot st standby host will automatically become the server. This is called as, this kind of an architecture is called as asymmetric clustering. I'll repeat, in asymmetric clustering, we'll have one machine which will remain in the hot standby mode. Its job is to keep monitoring in the active server. The other, uh, uh, other machines will keep running the applications. So whenever the server fails, this uh, this machine which was in the hot standby mode will take up the job of the server. This kind of clustering is called as asymmetric clustering. Then what is meant by symmetric clustering? In, two, in symmetric clustering, we will have two or more uh, hosts which will be running the application and as well as they will be monitoring each other. So you will not have any uh, system dedicated to be in the hot standby mode in symmetric cluster, clustering. They will be running the application as well as they will be monitoring each other. So mm -mm, this is uh, what is the 
uh, clustered system. So with this, we come to the end of the computer system organization and architecture. So with this, we will uh, stop uh, our uh, recording.